Woman of the Hour is the stranger than fiction story of an aspiring actress in 1970s Los Angeles whose life intersects with a serial killer in the midst of a years long murder spree when she's cast on an episode of The Dating Game. Based on a true story and directed by Academy Award nominee Anna Kendrick. Watch Woman of the Hour now playing only on Netflix, rated R. Ah, yes, the magnificent Trolley Sour Bright Crawler, also known as Trollicus Brightolus. The worm's captivating neon colour makes it an easy gummy prey. Trolley! It's a surprisingly sour, invitingly chewy, staggeringly snackable species unlike anything else found on this planet. Eat me! Delicious. Visit trolley.com to shop now. Trolley, eat me! This is an ad for better help. Welcome to the world. Please, read your personal owner's manual thoroughly. In it, you'll find simple instructions for how to interact with your fellow human beings and how to find happiness and peace of mind. Thank you, and have a nice life. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with an owner's manual. That's why there's BetterHelp Online Therapy. Connect with a credentialed therapist by phone, video, or online chat. Visit BetterHelp.com to learn more. That's BetterHelp.com. Welcome, everyone, and we are going to be uh, discussing Delphi, of course, once again. Um, to me, it's kind of uh, obsessive at this point. And uh, I am just of the mindset that I'm hearing a lot of people talk about it and I'm not hearing the things that should be talked about. Um, all right, let me add Allie. And hey, Allie. Hey. Um, so I think tonight uh, what we're going to try to focus on, obviously, some of the content will be repeating what I talked about uh, on the 19th when I was there. Um, as far as what I, I have digested after the fact, um, I'm having a really, really hard time uh, trying to figure out what the hell happened there. Sorry, I'm so, just smiling because I'm reading the comments like, hey, babe. So, uh, all right. Sorry, guys. Sorry for all the hiccups. But, you know, I mean, we're married and we're real people. So uh, someday we'll have a super polished show. Really? We're not there yet. Uh, but, wow. yeah, allegedly. So I was just telling him, I don't know if you could hear, basically where we're at. Where I'm at with this thing is I'm concerned uh, for many reasons but if you guys aren't aware everyone's aware obviously that both baldwin and uh rosie withdrew on the 19th and for anybody that didn't see the live um from that day when i was at the courthouse uh i basically just want to kind of rehash it uh, i want to be able to kind of go into a little more detail of what i saw and what i observed and um it's just it's it's one of these cases where I'm in, in increasing I'm increasingly concerned that this guy is is getting railroaded, and and first and foremost before we start this, any time that we're talking about uh, Abby and Libby's case, I need everyone to know that this isn't a side picking thing. This has nothing to do with sides. This has to do with getting justice for those two little girls and for their family. Period. And if that's Richard Allen, so be it. If it's somebody else, then we need to be investigating it. And that's what I'm concerned about. I, I'm concerned that it's gone beyond tunnel vision with Richard Allen. I'm concerned with the fact that I think that that they have locked into this guy uh, with really no evidence to speak of. Now, granted, they, they could have dug something up. Post arrest, that is always the case with any investigation. I say it all the time on the podcast. Look, you know, the arrest is just the beginning for investigations. Investigations start in earnest 
really when somebody's arrested because they have more access to that person than at any point prior to that. They're going to be able to get into all of his property, whether it be the house, cars, you know, if he's got storage sheds, they're going to be able to get all the electronic devices, things that they couldn't necessarily have gotten all of prior to. I mean, sometimes they'll get a search warrant prior to arrest. And based on that, they'll be able to get an arrest warrant. But in terms of full access to his person, uh, his property, and basically start investigating everybody uh, that he associates with, not in the sense that those people are being investigated uh, per se, but they're being spoken to and they're trying to get insight as to what this person's all about. That all comes after the arrest. So that certainly could be taking place with Richard Allen. My point is, and, and forget the memo. Before the memo, I never thought that Richard Allen was the guy. I, I just didn't. Like, based on that evidence that they presented in the PCA, and, and this will piss some people off. And again, we don't have to agree on everything. We're, we're never going to agree on everything. I, I promise you, through the life of this YouTube channel, there will never be a day that I will agree with everybody in the chat. And frankly, I don't care. Like, I'm not here to agree with people. If you guys don't like the opinions that we share on here, and that's what they are. There's facts, which we will always give you. And then after I talk about facts, I will sometimes give you my opinion on things. And my opinion on the Richard Allen case is that they have the wrong man in custody, period. The only thing that will ever change my mind about that is if this thing makes it to trial and the state has some actual evidence that he's the one who killed the two girls. If Abby and Libby came to their fate at his hand, then he needs to go away forever, period. And doing stupid stuff like taking away his lawyers doesn't help if he is guilty. Which is, you know, which is what we're really kind of getting to. And, um, you know, so they, like, this is not a like a bias thing. Like this, like, like somebody's like, oh, I think like somebody on Reddit today was like, oh, I think that your coverage of this is biased. I'm like, biased as to what? Bias because I want them to have the right person or persons in custody and going to trial for, for the brutal murder of these two beautiful girls. That's what my bias is. And that's it. If it's Richard Allen, they got a hell of a lot to prove to get there for that. If it's somebody else, they've got, I mean, hopefully they've, they've got something in their, you know, in their back pockets that we don't know about, but uh, yeah. Man, all the I'm things not... that they're doing pre-trial are just creating issues. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So, all right. And look, the way that this has gone down thus far has caused me great concern. So let's just jump to the 19th. The 19th, I drove out there uh, early morning, got out there around, I don't know, 11 o'clock. Crappy day in, in Allen County. It was raining. Uh, there was no line outside. I got nervous. I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, am I the first one here? <laughs> and I went in just to check the lay of the land. And the guy, you know, one of the sheriffs or the guys working out there was like, hey. He's like, yeah, you can't wear your watch. And I, had my, I knew I couldn't bring the phone in. They were very strict that no phones were allowed in at all. And uh, at that point, he's like, he, I had my sleeve pulled up because I was moving my arm or something. He's like, the Apple watch can't come in. I'm like, really? Like, it's my watch. He's like, it doesn't matter. All electronics. So whatever. Oh, I went back to the car. Come on. Yeah. Come on. I, I, I wasn't going to argue with the guy though. You know what I mean? He, he's, 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 like, he's like, oh, there's already 80 people up there. And I knew that the count pursuant to the judge was, I think 90 people max in that courtroom. So I, I'm freaking out. You know, it's 11 o'clock. I drove four and a half hours, whatever it was. Oh, like you thought he's going to make you take it out and not give you your spot back? I didn't have a spot. This was getting into the building. Wow. Right. Okay. I hadn't even gotten upstairs yet. And remember, it's not, this was not in Carroll County. This was in Allen County, which happens to be uh, Judge Gull's home county. That's where she sits on the bench on a regular basis. It, all, it also happens to be the county in which the change of veneer took place. So that is the county. Fort Wayne sits in that county is where they're going to be drawing the jury from, which is another question that is raised as she decided to move this particular hearing to her home turf. But we'll get there. So I, I get up there. Uh, they let us in at about one o'clock. You know, all the usual suspects are there. Uh, you know, after everything went down with the memo, 
and then the 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 leak with the with the crime scene photos and maybe more um you know it, it was it was it was on the radar all the media was there i think everybody had some kind of representation there at that point uh at one o'clock i get in i sit over to the right which happens to be uh richard's side and uh i happen to sit right behind kathy uh alan richard's wife and i also uh, i'm sitting behind his his mother they're both there and right away i notice that uh kathy's crying and and i've i've been to i think at this point four hearings and she's always there always and i always observe her not like trying to be a creep but like staring at her but you know i'll observe trying to be a creep that's what i heard yeah i mean that's the word on the street you know but i'm sitting there trying to observe her Th at this point i'm like like you know arm's length from her and she's crying early like an hour before the hearing in the meantime we had seen baldwin and uh dave hennessy who is old timer badass criminal defense attorney practice out in indianapolis been doing it forever guy looks like he's probably in his 80s early 80s or something like that if he's younger apologies david but um he, he looked to be you know he's long in the tooth he's been doing it a while um because we had learned that morning okay that uh hennessy had entered a limited appearance which means that he's not fully in the case and uh additionally that he had filed a four-page memorandum uh as to disqualification so that obviously took me by surprise okay um because leading up to the 19th there had been no mention whatsoever of a dq hearing at all and i was not aware and i look at the docket every day um i was not aware of any kind of motion hey there's exactly why you weren't supposed to have your watch on in the courtroom yeah exactly well this dude just like talks like he thinks i'm talking to him and he'll start like just saying shit. i don't even know what he's talking about so <laughs> but, but the point being that i don't know how this particular disqualification or removal hearing came to be there there is no evidence that mcleland or the state filed a motion for sanctions or removal on the docket there's no evidence of that whatsoever. As you know, Allison, the court can file something called sua sponte on their own motion. It appears that that's what's happened. However, there's no mention of it in either a court order or on the docket. It's so, going to be an issue on appeal because if they do things in chambers that affect the constitutional rights of the defendant, the fair trial... They should really have a court reporter back there. I mean, and maybe they did. So maybe, maybe they, it's of record. They very well might have. So if you, you know, you look at this docket, you have to wonder what is going on with this case. Now, when Gall originally got appointed, I was like, all right, I appreciate the fact that they're bringing an experienced judge onto this case. I had no real knowledge about Diener, but he backed out of the case anyway. It seems like at this point he had some foresight <laughs> in terms of trying to back out of it. It seems like it was a brutal. Who are you talking brutal. about now? Because I don't know all the players like you. So Diener was the original. He's a Carroll County judge. He's the judge oh. who was who granting the, he signed the arrest warrant, signed right. other warrants in this case. He's a Carroll County guy, but he recused himself early on. He's like, I've got conflicts, like all kinds of conflicts, emotionally, moral. I, I just can't sit. For on real? It. He threw that in there? Yeah, he was. That's actually shocking. He could not, like, he was very candid about not being able to uh, preside on this case. And it, I, I mean, I respect it. I would have rather him that done that than, you know, I mean, it's a small town. No, I mean, I, yeah, I, I respect it, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Unless he knows these these families or the people or I mean obviously that's different, but to just be so yeah. moral issue with the crime itself, that's kind of Yeah, no, I mean it's 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 very unjudgy. 
You know, yes. I mean that that's like very unjudging. You take the bench if you if you're conflicted out, if you've had former clients uh standing in front of you, um, you know, that's an issue. If you've got uh moral dilemmas, it's really not supposed to be the issue. You're supposed to be able to put that to the side and and proceed. But whatever, I don't want to get caught up on Diener. So Gull Gull gets uh given the case. I like her initially. She seems, you know, I did some research on her and I'm like, Hey, all right. She, she's, she's got some experience. Like, I don't think she's good. You always worrying about uh, in a case like this, you worry about judges being over their skis in terms of, are they going to be able to handle it? Because every case that is big, that has the magnifying glass, every case like that is going to always have crazy stuff happen. Always. It's just, it's just how the law is. I mean, frankly, every case, there is no such thing as a perfect case or trial. There just isn't. You know, it's like now we're watching them and everything's under the magnifying glass. We're watching every phase of a trial, which is a new thing, frankly. This was this didn't used to be the case. When we were in law school, there was no watching, diligently watching the, you know, the pretrial portions of any kind of case. It didn't, it didn't exist. And, you know, that's because of the internet. The internet is what really made that possible. It really opened all of us up to kind of the practice of law. You know, we've got a bunch of mini lawyers out there. We've got a bunch of mini researchers out there, a bunch of like, I've got 50 people that I would consider to be without question paralegals, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're able to, to work these dockets and look at documents like any paralegal I've ever known, you know, and that is all part and parcel of what's been going on over the last 15, 20 years. So when you have a magnifying glass on a case like this, you're going to see the warts. Now this case has gone to the next level. So like I said, originally goal comes on, I'm good with goal. And then the filings start to happen. And the first thing that was filed by the defense is that let bail. You remember it, right? They were basically saying, look, we don't think there's enough evidence. Uh, we think that that there shouldn't even have been an arrest warrant, but we think moreover that you should give Richard Allen a bail because we don't think that they're going to be able to put enough evidence up really to, to sustain the fact that he shouldn't have a bond. Like, I was just going to say, I'm sure you remember, and maybe some other people have already heard me say it who are, are watching, but I think much of what they had in the Frank's motion could have been offered in support of a bond motion to show that the evidence wasn't great. The presumption and the evidence wasn't great against him, which, you know, speaks to the standard to hold somebody on, on bond on a, you know, capital case. Right. Exactly. Which was what we thought they were going to do. Like ultimately that I was so excited about that hearing because I thought it was going to be a mini trial only to come to find out that at some point the defense decided to amend that motion to a completely different motion. So the, the, so she never sets that thing for a hearing date. And then ultimately she ends up setting a hearing date for mid June and these guys end up, and I'm talking about Rosie and Baldwin, end up converting that let bail motion to that suppression motion that we were talking about. Right. And they made such a like a vague general suppression motion with no, you know, no specific actual indication that it was going to be a Frank's hearing. So I'm I'm assuming that there was some discussion again in chambers at where they fleshed it out, and that's why the judge came back and said, "Well, you know, you're going to have to file a Frank's motion with, you know, more details." Well, so that was that actually happened after the hearing, which ended up being not anything having to do with the suppression motion. Right. Like that's what I'm saying. This docket, it's it's never what it seems. I like I have not gone to court one time, driven to Delphi, either Carroll County or Wayne County, and had a hearing be what it was purported to be on the docket. Never, not like not one time. So that time was the whole thing where they were trying to get him out of Westville prison. Like that's what the entire hearing was about. And then she said exactly what you said at the end, 
that look, and, and I believe, what was your theory? Go ahead and like, cause you had a theory of what had happened back in chambers with respect to that motion, probably why she said that. Right. Just like I j sort of just mentioned that it was so vague and they must've made some reference to, to it going down like the Franks Avenue and she needs, says you need to meet your burden in the motion. So go file a more specific motion that lays out your, your, you know, Frank's issues. Right. And, and she, she stated on the record, of course, it's not in the court order. I was reviewing the court orders today and she doesn't even mention that, you know, that the defense is going to be filing a Frank's notice. So, all right. So fast forward. So February goes by. Okay. And we're in June. June is the hearing with the, you know, with all the prison officials, she waits about a month and then denies their motion to move him for reasons unknown. I mean, we've got suitable counties aside from Carroll. Cass County was perfectly suitable. The warden up there was like, or was the warden or the sheriff? I can't remember at this point. was like, yeah, we could take him. He's like, do I want him? No, but can we handle him? Can our facility handle him? Yes, it can. So she had a great option, yet she chose to keep this. This was the first sign for me that Gull was way more state and law enforcement sided than I thought. Cause you're like, look, you're always trying to figure that out. If you're lawyers, right? I mean, if you're criminal defense attorneys, you're going in, you're getting a little bio on the judge. You're seeing what their background is. And we've talked about it before on, on lives. You know, I mean, the typical track is state's attorney's office bench. It, it's far less typical to go defense bar bench. doesn't mean that there aren't defense attorneys on the bench. There are, but a vast majority of them went the prosecutor route. Now, you know, I, I'm certainly not trying to cast shade and make any kind of insinuation that they're biased towards the state, but they're biased towards the state. They're biased okay. towards the state. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I like, Subconsciously, I mean, we see it every day. It, it, it there is a right. I, I don't need right. We we do not need to apologize for it. We got beat over the head for twenty plus years that they're they're state state sided all the time, you know. And, and it's like it's like if there's not enough going against the defendant and the defense attorneys in terms of the state having all the power, all the resources, all that stuff, to then have the judge basically deny all of our motions to sustain all of our objections <laughs> or deny our all of our yeah. right overrule our objections, sustain them for the defense or for the state. It's like, it gets tiresome. It gets, it, right. but it, I mean, even as little as just asking the state, like, what, what the actual circumstances are or what, you know, like I, I mentioned it not long last time. They uh, last motion I was doing, the judge turned to the state and was like, uh, do you agree with, you know, what she said here about X, Y, and Z. And they're like, no, which was absurd. Right. Um, but yeah. So ultimately I've got the feeling that like, I'm not loving Gull anymore. Okay. From like after that hearing, after she makes that ruling and keeps Alan in there for no reason, no, no apparent reason. What surprises me is the fact that no, no action was taken on any of the motions. Like, I just don't understand why they're sitting there that long. They're not being addressed. Like, it's just seems, seems odd. Well, that, and, it, it turns into this thing where we have huge motions filed. Like there has not been there. And I'm talking about for both sides. There are motions on file. If there are no hearing dates whatsoever, some, can be tabled. You know, I mean, them trying to get the state trying to get Richard Allen's medical records from the jail can be tabled. Those are not pressing. Getting him an instant transfer for him out of a prison when we find out, believe it or not, like, I don't care what your opinion on is, like with the Odin thing, the guards have Odin patches. They admitted it. The state admitted it. It's improper and it's scary. I would not want my defendant in there. He shouldn't be in a prison to begin and, with. Right, that's the first and foremost. Why is he there? And someone, another county jail told you that they would 
take him, could get him there, could protect him. It just makes no sense. It, it makes zero sense. And then since I jumped ahead, just to finish the, the end of that with the judge and televising this most recent one, immediately afterwards, she made an order that said, well, we're going to reconsider this whole televising thing. Well, what's interesting, and you really did like way leap ahead with that. Um, like, but there is like no, no part of me that is going to be sitting here talking about some giant conspiracy theory. However, starting to look like a giant conspiracy, starting to look a lot like a giant conspiracy. Um, so, but, but like, I want to build up to it because like, so I'm going to jump back to the day of, sorry, okay, but no, no, because, but I'm going to go back because like, leading up to it is important, but like the day of, so Kathy's crying the whole time. I see Baldwin. I see Rosie like running around back in chambers because her bench is up in front of us. We're in the gallery. They've got the door open to the back hallway. That's obviously leading to her chambers. And you can see people frantically running around. Now a half an hour in, they pull Kathy back. Like, like Rosie comes out. Like she went back, back in chambers. She went or back like in chambers. Or, or at least to, talk little... to Richard. I, right. We don't even know if Richard makes it into the building. I'm assuming that he did, which we're going to get into that. We're going to get into the fact that we never lay eyes on him while all of a sudden his attorneys are withdrawing, not on the record. But we'll get there because it's, it's, it's bizarre. I've never I want to jump to the end, Bob. Yeah, I know you do. You're, you <laughs> really do want to jump to the end. So, <laughs> so, and actually, I think it was, I think it was uh, her bailiff. I think the judge's bailiff came out and got Kathy. Kathy went back there for 10, 15 minutes, like sobbing when she comes back, just like destroyed. Like, and I said it in the last one, like it took everything in my power not to like lean in and, and say, hey, you know. I got your back here. Like, I, I think that there's something, something going like on that's nefarious. And, and like, I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't have proof. I am not sitting here with receipts. Anything that I am going to be saying that is not factual in terms of court dates and motions that were filed is opinion and opinion alone. But I have the advantage as you do of doing this for 20 plus years and some pretty high stakes cases. I know how it works in these types of cases. That Garcia thing, man, like mirrors this thing in a lot of different ways. A lot of ways, yeah. A lot of ways, like a lot of ways, all the way to you getting removed from that case, which was much easier for them because we were in Pro Hoc Vice. All right, and keeping him in segregation 23 hours a day. Tw well, yeah, I mean, everything. Everything, about, everything about it is, is disturbingly similar. And and it, like, I have a different feeling about Allen than I might about Garcia. Even you know what I'm saying? Like, like I don't like I honestly don't think Allen's the right guy. Whereas it's possible. Hey, let's just stick with Allen. All right. So Kathy comes back. She's destroyed. And about one fifty, and the hearing's supposed to start at two o'clock. Uh, about eight to nine. Cops walk in, including Doug Carter, Tony Liggett. I was asking everybody about me. I'm like, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who the like? We don't know. We're trying to figure it out. They were all cops, though. And they don't sit in the gallery with us, like in the front row. They don't have like a little area, you know, because typically cops, when they're testifying in court, they do sit in the jury box. So I, I didn't take it as unusual. Because right, they they're call, sitting in there waiting for court to start, waiting for their case to get called. That's that's very common. It's common for a full call. Meaning, oh, yeah. if you've got 10 different cops and that's their key date and they're in there and it's a bunch of traffic tickets or misdemeanor arrests and they're there to testify, it's not unusual. When this is the only matter up and there's nothing else happening... And there's no hearing actually set. And there's no actual hearing set that we know of, that we're aware of. But the judge did say that she was expecting something. She was going to do something that day. Well, the, the order the order doesn't read like that. The, the order basically says, so she drops this order. Like the 19th just appears out of thin air. But like we've got to tell the story and then go back and say, okay, this is sus. 
this is sus. This stinks. This is weird. So at about, like, like I said, 150, these guys all roll in. So at that point, I'm thinking one of two things. I'm thinking either he is going to get DQ'd and they're going to a full hearing on a DQ thing, even though I had not seen any kind of motion, he being Baldwin. Because at this point, I, like there, there has been no mention of Rosie doing anything. They have separate offices. They have their own practices. They're both in private practice that were both appointed to the case as PDs. They're being paid by the county, but they have separate practices. And it, and it appeared to me, I, I don't know if Rosie had his own set of discovery or if Baldwin was the caretaker of all the discovery, but Baldwin had some shit go down. Like Baldwin had a guy in his office who basically, and, and you know, Sleuthy Goosey, who's like my go-to on, on pulling all my data. She did an incredible, uh, that was the thing I was trying to get up. Like she did a, just a baller timeline for me. And like, I ran out of time to get it up, <laughs> but I'm going to get like, uh, trust me, Sleuthy, I'm going to get this thing up, but I'm going to, I'm going to refer to it now. Um, you know, he ends up, uh, at that point, like, I'm like, like they're going to DQ him because you and I were talking about it, right? Like if he's got this guy in there and he's keeping sloppy care of the, the discovery, I mean, you and I have never locked up discovery in a gun safe, dude. I'm sorry. No. It's like, we like, had a, a whole separate room for Garcia, but we did make everyone in our office sign um, protective orders. Right. And, and so, and that was the overarching theme because like Gull had signed a protective order back on 2017. So, I mean, there's certainly a technical violation going on. Like, like him not keeping careful watch or, I mean, can he control if this, if this Cohen guy came in and took the photographs. No, I mean, it sounds like at, at least from the motion, you know, if you take it at face value, like this guy was intentionally snooping where he shouldn't have been. Like he gained access under false, false pretenses and he's a lawyer. So I, I feel like, you know, aren't you supposed to assume that the, a friend of yours who you're letting in your office is not going to. Maybe, maybe not like in a case like this, like there had been, like there were leaks that preceded this, you know what I mean? That like there had been issues with Baldwin's office before, you know. Like it sounds like he had kind of a sloppy office. Like you know, like I know a lawyer like that who's brilliant. <laughs> who, if you looked at her, if you looked at her desk, you wouldn't necessarily think you know that she was very organized, but. You know, a lot of times brilliant people are like that. You know, they're, they're not necessarily organized. I, I think there's something to be said that people that aren't quite as brilliant need everything organized in a very particular fashion because it's more difficult for them to, to kind of peruse through it. Whereas people that are maybe a little more bright, I don't know. That's a total. No, that's ridiculous. I think it's a great theory, though. I, but there, there is a lot of, I think it's just like a certain side of your brain type of thing that comes with it. But there's definitely tons of very brilliant, organized, structured in their thinking and in their history. I, like, I, I'm never speaking in like, uh, like completes. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, it's like, they're, like there's always going to be brilliant people that are incredibly organized. Like, like there's a ton of brilliant people that are very a type that are extremely right. organized. Exactly. So right. For sure. I, I was, I was making a joke to kind of spare you. Cause you know, I know, I know. I appreciate um, it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I but I want you to So, uh, so it's, at some point, uh, these things leak out and, and, you know, but you and I had had the discussion in terms of, did we think it was enough? Like is a technical. No, and we didn't. And, and I don't, and like, and this is, this is what I want you to explain. And, and because of, because of what reason, and it's, it's an interesting scenario because of the fact that these guys are appointed as PDs. Meaning I mean, it's the, it's the only like little shred of something, you know, well, there, there's two things because technically now the lawyer asked to withdraw. So if the so let me start over. All right. So what we're talking about is the Sixth Amendment right 
to Thank counsel. You. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and when you are paying for your own lawyer, you obviously have the right to the counsel of your choosing. When you are indigent and getting court appointed lawyer, you do not have a right to a specific appointed lawyer. However, once you are appointed that lawyer, the argument is you have the same right to the continued representation of your choice as someone who is not indigent. And that's therein lies the rub. So if you deny in a typical situation, if you deny someone who has retained counsel of their rights of counsel of choice, like not giving a continuance for some silly reason and then making him get like another lawyer, denying someone their Sixth Amendment right to the counsel of their choice is what is called in the law a structural error. Because most things in the law, you need to show prejudice. You need to show the court because like they don't want to just be doing things just for doing them. You know, so they, it's like, show me how this prejudiced you. Show me how this played against you. But with something like denying you the lawyer of your choice, they have no way of determining the harm. So that harm, when it's a structural error, it's the rare times in the law doesn't matter. If, if, you, if there was a structural error, it is reversed. You are starting over. Now, there are like split circuits on whether or not the continued representation of court appointed counsel interferes and rises to the level of a structural, a structural error. In this case, if it had been just the judge forcing him to leave and not him, whatever, seemingly acquiescing to the leaving, because obviously he initially filed a motion against it, you know, um, there would have been a very strong er argument that that was a structural error because both the lawyer and the uh, defendant wanted to keep his lawyer and the judge interfered with that, you know, for, for a reason that, that wasn't necessary, you know, not, not enough to interfere with such a, uh, an important, significant constitutional right. And that's what I was going to ask you. Is there a situation where you have a, a, a leak of, you know, because I'm listening to Brett on STS last night, and and, and Brett's like, I, I cannot wait to debate this, that like Brett on this thing. It's like he he's avoiding me like the plague on this thing, man. But like Brett, if you're watching, I'm ready, buddy. Um, you know, the, the, like, look, the fact of the matter is, all of that evidence, and and whether it's it's not a matter of whether or not the public's going to see it at trial. It's it's coming into evidence at trial. It's like you're either worried about it tainting the jury pool, which the argument as to that is that no defense attorney in the history of the world would ever want pictures of two beautiful little girls that were butchered to get out to the public before trial. Cause all that does is create just hate and animus. And it's all going to be directed at the guy that they've arrested, Richard Allen. It, it just, it incites people. It, it's the exact reason that we have motions in limine, which are motions that are filed right before trial, where we are trying to either keep things out or put things in. Right. Right sort of an early objection or an early proffer of evidence. Exactly. So in this situation, the argument being, and, and Brett made this argument last night. He said, well, because of their crazy 136 page memo, they felt, and he, he's just, he, he admitted he was speculating, but the argument would be that they really wanted to be able to prove that these sticks that were on the girls were placed in such a way that somebody could could very much think that they were runes or somebody trying to create runes. And that that is enough for them to forego the fact that those sticks happen to be on top of the two beautiful slain girls you can't you can't have the pictures of the sticks without having the pictures of the girls. It doesn't work because well, the girls what we were, were told 
from someone who looked at the pictures, we did not want them, right. that you could not see the runes in the pictures. It wasn't like it wasn't depicted in the pictures. I've like <sighs> not the ones, not the ones that this person had seen. Right. But I like, I don't know who's seen what that that's right. the other problem with the leak. You know, it's like, we've got the leak, which I refer to as the drip. And I was, you know, somebody was out there losing their mind. Cause I called it a drip It's a drip. None of us have seen it. A leak is when the world knows about it. And right. none of us know about it. It seems like a handful of people have allegedly seen the pictures. I have no reason to think that the murder sheet would lie about it. I'm assuming that they got them. I'm assuming that Rick Snay got them. Well, I think murder sheets said they deleted them, but I, I don't know. That's I guess not the they point. They got them. Whether they deleted them or not, they, they received them. Like, uh, unsolicited, they got the pictures. Which happens. People send me stuff all the time, too. Like, I mean, and murder sheets knee-deep in this case, and they have been forever. So, you know, they're going to be somebody, if, like, somebody's trying to get something out, murder sheet's going to be an avenue, murder sheets shut it down, you know, for... I mean, like they, they weren't about to do that and, and Snay didn't either. And you know, like, but I, like, I don't know if Rick Snay really got the pictures. I, I don't know. I mean, he's saying he did. My point is that nobody descend, disseminated them to the public. They never right. made it out. Right. So I agree. A drip. Th it is a drip. I'm sorry. That's not what a leak is. A leak is a, like, you know, like you've got something that just it's gushing. Out. It's gushing. It's, it's all gushing. Over. It's gush. It, like it just, it never got to that point. Thankfully. I'm, I'm, right. I'm thrilled. I'm not rooting for a leak. What I'm right. talking about is the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is it got it got snubbed out before it became a real leak. Thankfully. But that is the fact. And that is the fact that Judge Gull had presented to her. That this wasn't a full-blown leak. Yes, he appears to be very sloppy in terms of him keeping the, the discovery on lock. Right? He's allowing it. To, to, you know, be photographed or he's allowing it to get out to the public or some portion of the public, or he's got somebody in his office that's allowing it to get out to the public or disseminating to the public or portions of the public. But it, it was, it was limited to that. So, you know, in, in my estimation, it's just, it's not going to outweigh Richard Allen's sixth amendment. Right. Not even by a long shot. Like it's, it's not that kind of infraction. And, and, you know, and Brett was like, Brett went so far as to say that we now have a, another death that is potentially as a result of this leak. Now, we have no way of knowing that. Like, that is, uh, yeah, I that is something way too far. I have no idea what was going on in this guy's life. None. I, I, I don't know. Like, it seems like, like an excessive reason to kill yourself that you let you let a you shared a picture. Well, especially when there's like for private citizens, I don't know that there's any recourse. I, like I, there is no crime they could be charged with. This isn't the yeah, trespassing. Uh, um, no, he was invited. He was invited to. No, he exceeded his invitation. How do you know? To, well, then the other lawyer let him have it. Well, no, I mean, like, he didn't say you could never come in my, I, like, did Baldwin say you could never come into my office? No, but I'm just saying if he took something that would legally constitute a trespass because you're exceeding the permission that you were, you know, given. I, I, I mean, the bigger problem is that, that the, the guy who takes the pictures, Cohen, like, he's not under the protective order, but he is because, like, like I think that there could have been a rule to show cause filed against him. Because like the, the way that the protective order read is that, look, you, you know, you can give it to your investigators, you can give the discovery to, you know, experts. And, you know, if there's people in your office that need access to it, but everybody, but you are responsible for everybody that you put that discovery in their hands or access to it, that they fall under all of the purview of the. Right, you're, they're supposed to have to give them a copy of that order. Right which we don't know if that happened or not. Hey, beautiful humans, Bob here. I wanted to talk to you for a minute about a sponsor that we absolutely love. And that sponsor is Shopify. And why do we love Shopify? Well, because they give small business owners and entrepreneurs the ability to be able to get their incredible products out to market. 
with their own virtual storefronts and with only a minimal amount of effort. And then Shopify helps them become big businesses. Look, I'm dead serious here. Shopify has absolutely changed the game. As hundreds of thousands of businesses that may have never had the opportunity to get their products out to the public are now completely in the game. Brands like Death Wish Coffee, Magic Spoon Cereal, Gym Shark all sell their amazing products through Shopify. And it's not just the small growing businesses that sell through Shopify. It's the big dogs too, like Heinz and Mattel. But what else separates Shopify from everyone else that helps small businesses turn into big businesses? Well, how about because it's the number one checkout experience on the planet? Or maybe it's Shop Pay, which boosts conversions up to 50%. That means that less carts go abandoned and way, way more sales are happening. This is the bottom line. The businesses out there that sell more, quite simply, sell on Shopify. So upgrade your business and get the same checkout that Gymshark, Death Wish Coffee, Magic Spoon, Heinz, and Mattel use. So sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash dd. Again, go to shopify.com slash dd to upgrade your selling today. That's shopify.com slash dd. I can tell you this, as soon as our t-shirts and all our merch is ready, there's only one place on the planet where Defense Diaries is going to be selling their goods, and that, my friends, is Shopify. Hey guys, Bob here. I want to talk to you a bit about investing. Yeah, you know that concept of making your money work for you? Yeah, well, I was always afraid to invest because I knew nothing about it. I didn't know how to enter into the market. I didn't know how to buy stocks. I didn't know how much money I needed. I didn't know if I had enough money. I didn't know if I did have enough money who I'd give the money to to invest it for me. I didn't know what kind of stocks to buy. All of the excuses that I had. And frankly, when I was young, I just wasn't thinking about retirement. I wasn't thinking that far ahead. And I wish that today's sponsor, Acorns, existed 30 years ago when I was in my 20s because I would have been in the market now at this point for 30 years. So what is Acorns? Well, glad you asked. Acorns makes it easy to start automatically saving and investing for you, your kids, and your retirement. And guess what? You don't need a lot of money or expertise to invest with Acorns. In fact, you can get started with just your spare change. Acorns recommends an expert-built portfolio that fits you and your money goals, then automatically invests your money for you. And now, Acorns is putting their money into your future. Open an Acorns Later IRA and get up to a 3% match on new contributions. That's extra money for your retirement. How cool is that? Look, guys, long before Acorns was a sponsor of our show, I was using Acorns to invest my money. I thought the concept of using spare change from transactions to invest in the market was so ingenious that the minute I found out about it, I signed up and got an account. So if you were like me and you were hesitant about getting into the market, forget all that. Dive in with Acorns. Let them do the work for you. Let them do the research for you. Let them be your guide into investing your money. I did years ago, and I couldn't be happier. So head to acorns.com slash DD or download the Acorns app to start saving and investing for your future today. Paid non-client endorsement compensation provides incentive to positively promote Acorns. Investing involves risk. Acorns Advisors, LLC, and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. View important disclosures at acorn.com slash dd. This is what you do when you've just found that statement handbag on eBay and you want to build an entire wardrobe around it. You start selling to keep buying. Yep, on eBay. Over that all-black everything phase? List it and buy all the color. Feeling more vintage than ever? It's out with the new and in with the pre-loved. Next thing you know, you've refreshed your wardrobe basically without spending a dime. Yeah, eBay, the place to buy and sell new, pre-loved, vintage, and rare fashion. Um, so, but at any rate, uh, like, so I'm sitting there, like, debating with people as we're waiting for this hearing. So 2 o'clock, like I said, it comes and goes. It's 2.15. We're like, man, I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, are they, are they dismissing the charge? Like, I actually was starting to think it. I wrote it on a, like a little piece of paper so I could like sarnack it, like give it to somebody. It was like, oh, I'm pretty, because I'm like, something was just off and I could sense it. 
I could just feel it that something was off. And, and I, I just, I, I couldn't place what it was. Now I had been talking to, to Kevin, uh, outside in the hallway from murder sheet. And, you know, I mean, his position was he thought Baldwin was going to get removed. You know, I mean, they're not shocked that they're both out of the case, but the fact of the matter is they weren't DQ'd. They weren't removed. They were withdrawn. I mean, they withdrew their, their appearances, which is a whole different thing. It just is. So when it finally gets to be around 2.30, Rosie comes like barreling out of, you know, back from Chambers, walks, does a beeline right to Kathy and Richard's mom, leans over. He's like, all right. He's like, come with me. Like Kathy's sobbing. <laughs> and he's like, come with me. And they both get up and they go out of the back of the courtroom. Like two minutes later, Richard's mother comes back and grabs both their sweaters. And I'm like, dude, they're like leaving. They're out. They're out. I'm like, so that that's a huge signal to me that something dramatic is happening. So two minutes after that, then Gull comes out. And then Gull has her five-minute hearing. And she basically, like the thing that's most, you know, she says, look, something unexpected. Like the only thing that I cared about that she said was that something unexpected happened this afternoon, which can only be referring to Rosie withdrawing. She did not anticipate that Brad Rosie was going to be withdrawing. She thought she was going to bounce Baldwin off the case or that Baldwin would relent and withdraw and that Rosie would stay on. And, and I think it took her by surprise. She was stunned. She sat on the bench and you could see it in her face. She was like, well, maybe her little plan backfired on her. Well, her little, so th let's, now we're going to backtrack. Okay. Now we're going to backtrack to the, the whole camera thing. All right. So Rosie and Baldwin file uh, a motion. Okay. Where, wherein they're asking for all the hearings to be televised, you know, and, and the argument there is that all the pro Allen is guilty. People are like, Oh, you know, this is just the defense, you know, trying to continue to put forward their ridiculous theory that this is a ritual sacrifice. They're trying to pound us over the head with it and whatever, whatever. And the state basically comes in on the opposite side of that. They're saying we don't want the cameras. We're very concerned about having cameras in this case, especially for pretrial stuff. And, and I got to be honest, like from a pretrial motion standpoint, I almost prefer that they not be televised because right. that's, that's where like, you don't need the potential jury pool hearing about all the stuff that is going to end up not coming into evidence like that. Like that's what I'm always saying. It's where the war is really waged in any trial is all the pretrial stuff. If like, if, if real court observers like would take my word for it and start observing these pretrial motion things, which now we're starting to see, they will soon realize they're way more exciting than the trials themselves because that's where the fight over what's going to get in it is evidence and what's going to stay out. That's like what everything is. Every battle that takes place, all the motion work is about what's getting in, what's staying out, what's getting in, what's staying out, you know? And, and like, you don't necessarily want it's like the it's like the thing that they were pulling with the with the dog sniff in Omaha on us. They knew that there was a hundred year old law that that could never come in. Yet they filed the motion that their dog had a hit eight years after the fact on a on a like not not even on a piece or an article of clothing. They say that the dog got a hit off the concrete street eight years after the fact for for Thomas Hunter, and that made it into the paper, and that was out there. It was goal achieved for the state. They, they could care less that that was ever going to get into trial because their goal was to get it out to the public, which is the same argument that everybody's making about the defense here, that they wanted to get all this stuff out to the public so that they could get their defense out, which if we're just talking about the playing field being equal, Look, the, uh, a PCA and, and people that don't understand PCAs, and there's a lot of you out there, and I'm looking directly into the camera. There are a lot of you out there that don't understand the PCAs. All you people that are out there that say, oh, they're not putting the best evidence in the PCA. Wrong. 
Yes, they are. They're always putting the best evidence that they have at the time in the PCA. They're never holding back smoking gun evidence in a PCA for a gotcha moment because there's no such thing. There's no such thing as a gotcha moment. They have to turn everything over to the defense and, and discovery anyway. There is no gotcha moment. That is their first opportunity to get their case in chief, their theory of the case out to the public. Right. And that's it. And, and then, of course, they're going to continue to investigate. And if they find new evidence and additional evidence, that, of course, is going to be brought in a trial. But in terms of a PCA, when you're basing your opinion on innocence or guilt on a PCA, it's not been vetted. And all it is is the state's theory of the case, period. That's all it is. It's, it, it's, it's police went out and did an investigation. Once they lock in on somebody, that's their guy. And everything that they do, everything that they say, everything that they write is written from the perspective of that's our guy. So I right. mean, you have to take all of it with a grain of salt. That's the entire point of a trial. Typically, motions and lemonade are filed much closer to trial because you're dealing with the trial issues. But once it is on the, the docket, typically there, there will be a hearing date set for motions and lemonade. Sometimes it's even before motions and lemonade are filed. It's like motions and lemonade have to be filed by X date and we're going to have a hearing on X date, but it depends in this, in this court, or at least for this case, it's unusual that motions get filed without any sort of date associated with it. Typically you file a motion and you notice it up for a certain date or, you know, you notice it up for the next, the next hearing date. I mean, the next scheduled court date, unless it's something that you need to be addressed, you know, sooner. And that's not happening here, but in theory, eventually there will be uh, a hearing on the docket for maybe, Maybe well, there should be right. And typically there would also be um, an order on the ruling, but whether that'll be sealed or not is another. I mean, point. at this point there is the, the case is not sealed. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's like, I, I, I not allow the Supreme court has, has definitely said they do not want entire cases sealed. It has to be, you know, document by document, pleading by pleading. Um, and it has to meet the criteria in order for it to, to get sealed. And they're supposed to put those reasons, you know, on the, on the record. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe the motion in Lemonade regarding ballistics is just still sitting there because it's tr trials not really happening until so much further out. So yeah. And some things lawyers just put, you know, they file, it's on the record. And like Bob kind of said before, it sort of just sits there until you need to address it. Um, so, yeah, but here's the problem. All right. There, there were motions that needed to be addressed that were not getting addressed. She was not setting hearing dates like on anything. I still don't know what the hearing on the 31st of October is supposed to be. I didn't know it on the 19th. I still don't know it now. She, like, she will just not come out. She didn't say it's going to be on the Franks. She's not like, is, the, is it going to be the preliminary finding on the Franks hearing? We need to have that. Like, why is she letting that sit there and let the world go crazy about it? Forget about like, oh, like here's my problem with with as much as I respect what Rosie and Baldwin were trying to do, aside from Baldwin's sloppiness, in terms of the 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 effort that they were putting into defending their client, I respected it a lot because they were fighting for their clients. They were really putting in a huge amount of work to to fight for this guy. So much so that it it, it has the smell of a couple of lawyers that think that their client's actually innocent. That's how hard they were fighting. This was no, uh, we're just going through the motions. We're going to file all the shit that we have to file. And, you know, we've done our job. So thank you. You know what I mean? This did not have any of the signs of that. This had the signs of, we, we firmly believe that our client is innocent. And how Gull is letting these motions just sit without 
any kind of date being set to me is insane. But here's so she comes out. She's like, look, OK, like we had this unexpected thing happen. Both both of Richard Allen's attorneys have withdrawn from the case. And I'm like, boom. I'm like, no way. I'm like, I think I might have done that in the courtroom. Like, Wait, that, done what? Oh, they, yeah, they I did, did that anyway. <laughs> I think I might have. Um, but I'm like, wow. I'm like, I can't believe it. Like, I just cannot believe it. She's like, so needless to say, um, Richard Allen doesn't have an attorney right now. So we can't proceed to any hearings. So, which we had no idea what the hearing was going to be, but it was clear. And, and, I, and I broke off my train of thought earlier, you know, but it, like I was saying, it was either going to be maybe the preliminary finding for the Franks hearing, or it's going to be the DQ hearing. One of the two. At some point, you you realize, obviously, they were all there as a show of force for Nick Nick McClelland to to put the fear of God in Baldwin. That I got I got the receipts, bro. I sent these guys out, bro. They got you, bro. You know what I mean? And and like so, you know what took place that morning. So so goal. So now we're gonna go back. So this is where we're talking about when goal makes the decision. October 17th, two days before the hearing, Gull approves the cameras in the courtroom for the 1019 hearing on the court's own motion. Okay. And then immediately afterwards, can you read that order? Do you have that up? Uh, I don't. I don't have that order. I I'll don't. grab it. Yeah, if you could pull it up. So two days before the mystery hearing, and pull up, pull up that order if you can as well. The order setting the date for the 19th. So I find that very suspicious. I'm sorry, but I do. I find it very suspicious that she creates this order out of the blue under the guise that, Hey, look, I need everybody here. Okay. I'm, I'm everybody's ordered here. I'm transporting Alan here. We're having a thing and we're going to figure out we're going to work out the logistics of what exactly is happening on the 31st because apparently she doesn't know herself what's going to happen on the 31st. And then she gives this broad statement of that there, there is something else that has occurred that we need to discuss. Like it's, it's like, it's like language just like that. It's, it's, it's very, very strange language. Um, frankly, that I just did not. I, I just didn't get what she was saying. And, and like going into that hearing, I'm like, man, what does that mean? So we know now, now I'm going to read the tea leaves a little bit here. We know now that the, that the leak goes down early October. Okay. Oh. And murder sheets episode, uh, I think comes out October, uh, it looks like October 14th, their episode drops. Now, prior to this, Murder Sheet had reached out to Holman, who's who's uh, state police, state trooper. And, you know, they tell him, look, somebody's leaked some stuff to us. And, and what they say is that Holman takes it very seriously. At that point, it's announced... The leak, the, the fact that there is a leak is made public at that point, okay? And Indiana State Police announced publicly that they're going to investigate it. So at that point, Gull's aware of it, all right? So as of the 14th, for certain, Gull knows she probably knew as early as, I'd say, the 9th. Like, as soon as Holman knows... Holman's calling McClelland. McClelland's maybe calling Baldwin and Rosie and saying, hey, man, you guys got a problem here. Uh, you know, somebody snapped some pics in your office and they're leaking them on the Internet. You got an issue. And now the police, the Indiana State Police are investigating it. I got to go to the judge with it. Sorry, fellas. So, you know, McClelland goes to, to Gull. I'm sure they had either a teleconference or some kind of in-person conference off the record. And at that point, uh, soon thereafter, we get the mystery motion or the mystery order, wherein Gull sets the date for the 19th. And so at that point, Gull knows, 
All right, so Gull is contemplating. Okay, what am I going to do? She's probably got her, you know, her clerks doing some research on Sixth Amendment stuff. Is this going to get overturned? What are my problems with this? All the things that you were talking about with respect to the Sixth Amendment. You know, does it matter that they were appointed public defenders? You, you know, I mean, like all those issues, she's probably trying to research to see if she's going to get blowback at the appellate level. You know, if, if Richard Allen's convicted, is this going to cause this thing to get kicked back for structural error? So she, she has to be looking at that and she must come to a conclusion that I'm willing to take the chance that this is not the first leak. This has happened before. I'm, I'm irritated with the fact that they filed that memo, not under seal, and they did it intentionally because she sealed that thing two hours after it was filed. I mean, the clerk sent it to us and then the thing gets, the thing gets sealed by the judge. She's like, whoa, you know, so, so she has these things going on in her mind. And then we have the 17th order. So and she makes a point in the order on the 17th where she's saying she's going to have cameras in there for just this hearing. <laughs> Not the hearing on the 31st, but just this hearing. I'm going to have cameras in there. We'll see how it goes. And she makes it a point to mention the fact that you look frustrated. What's up? I couldn't find. I don't know where I saved that order where she says that. It's all right. We've reconsidered allowing cameras oh you mean the one that i'm talking about yeah I the mean, one after that where she's like yeah you know what we might not keep doing this oh, oh you mean after the fact right 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 so but that order where she's allowing the camera she makes it a point to talk about how rosie and ball went and filed a motion asking for cameras it's that old you know be careful what you wish for what you ask for you might actually you know i might actually get it type situation so she approves it on the 17th. I, I think at that point, she knows she's DQing Baldwin, like unequivocally. She's going to DQ him. She thinks Rosie's going to stay on. She doesn't think that she's submarining the entire case at that point. So I think that morning, uh, she let, like, and, and look, David Hennessy, old timer, old pit bull criminal defense guy from Indy. He gets hired. He gets hired on by Baldwin to represent him. Now, Brett was asking this question, Allison, and I'm going to quiz you. Brett's like, I've never heard of a lawyer having to hire a lawyer in a case like this. Like, I've never, I can't think of any reason why. Can you think of a reason why? Well, yeah, you want someone to speak on your, on your behalf when the judge is threatening to disqualify you or remove you from the case. Yeah, and he would have to testify. Theoretically, both right. You might have to testify. testify. You need to have a lawyer representing you to to have that hearing. So, it, like, so he's like, it's definitely unusual. So, I mean, that's yeah, but like these circumstances are right. Are yeah, you know, I mean, theoretically, we should have gotten a lawyer for you on we the did. thing. Oh, we did. That's right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not that unusual. So, at, at that point, we're like, at the point where Gull is saying, "Hey, all right." You guys come back in chambers. Hennessy files his limited appearance and his memorandum, his four-page memorandum, arguing against DQ, saying both these guys, but my client definitely wants to stay in the case. So, like, as of the 19th, the morning of the 19th, they had every intention to go in there and fight to stay on the case, or Baldwin did. And I don't know, like, you, you know, like, realistically... I mean, my, again, now this is not just facts, but just what my initial thought was, was that the judge essentially, you know, like said, like, if you don't withdraw, I am, this is turning into a bigger issue. It's going to become a disciplinary issue because if a judge disqualifies you and removes you from a case, that's automatically something that the disciplinary commission is going to look at. It's like a strike on your on your record. So that, that was what I kind of assumed was that she said, you better quit before you get fired because this is the, this is the ramifications. And I think you were thinking the same, like, and the, the cameras were to intimidate him. Like, and it's all going to be on live television. So what do you want to do? hundred percent. 
like that's exactly what it is. So she, but like she set it up that way. In like, our yeah. an opinion. In our opinion. Right. Right. I mean, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see how it laid out. You know, you, you don't have right. to be a rocket scientist to see that she, she sets the, the hearing for the 19th. She then on the 17th, she then approves the cameras in the courtroom on the 19th. You know, she basically calls them all back into chambers. She, I think, is a courtesy to Baldwin. She tells him, look, you know, you have two choices here. You know, you can withdraw. I'll, I'll allow you to withdraw. Or we're going to go to a hearing. And, and people that don't understand about pretrial hearings is that judges typically in a pretrial hearing will tell you, more likely than not, this is how I would rule. So she's giving Baldwin, I, I've looked everything over. I think it's gone too far afoot. I, I'm concerned with your continued representation in the case. I, I think that I think that Richard Allen can survive with, with Rosie and I'll bring somebody else in. I'm sorry, Andrew, but you know, my 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 feeling on this is that I'm gonna disqualify you. However, you do have the opportunity to withdraw or you, of course, have the opportunity to go ahead and go to hearing. hearing on it. And just, you you know, <laughs> as you asked for them, that I've got cameras in the courtroom. You wanted it, buddy. Right. So if you want me to undress you publicly and <laughs> humiliate you, and, and, and this is where it goes to your point, because that is all out there for the disciplinary committee, whereas these facts now aren't getting out to them. They are not of record. There is not a mandatory referral to the disciplinary committee because he wasn't removed. Now, that doesn't right. mean they're not going to come after him because they're aware of it. You know, they, they, he's still probably going to get a ding, but it's going to be a whole different ballgame. They're going to have a hell of a lot less evidence against him. And, and if you're wondering what a disciplinary committee does, they're the ones who can sanction you. They can suspend your license. They can disbar you. They can fine you. There's, there's many things they can do. So, you know, I mean, he's left with what I would consider to be a Hobson's choice, which is really no choice at all. And, and that's like, he's like, all right, you got me. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to withdraw from the case. Where she gets just pimp slapped completely is when Rosie's like, well, if he's going, I'm going, you know? And, and like, that's a part of the conversation I, I want to have with you. And, and I know that we had it a little bit, but... You know, I mean, what do we think that con because like leading into this day, you know that him and Rosie are talking constantly about the possibilities of what can happen. You know what I'm saying? And and like like it, it seemed like for me when I'm watching it live and watching it transpire and watching the back and forth and the running and Kathy going back, she went back twice, back back into chambers. And I think one of the times was to explain to her that she's basically, you know, her husband's losing both of his lawyers. And and that's when she comes out. And then that's when Rosie pulls her out of the courtroom. But like, what do you think that conversation, like, what do you guess is Rosie's reason for, for, for dipping out? So this is just my opinion. I know you've got a different opinion and it's just one, one possibility, really. It's, it's not necessarily my opinion, but it's one possibility that I think could be what was going on. And it's that when you're handling a case like this, you've got to set aside a large portion, you know, of your practice and, you know, yes, you're getting, you're getting paid, but you're getting paid much less you, than you would. If you're getting privately paid, you can't take any new clients or very nominal new clients. I don't think I'm assuming one possibility could be that he did not want to reinvest all of that time doing it over again with a new, with a new lawyer. Right. I mean, but the other, the, the, the other side of that coin is this is a career builder case. If you've got a client that you believe is actually innocent and it appears to me that there's some substantial evidence to that effect that's exculpatory, like people just ignoring Elvis Field. forget about Brad Holder. Like, like, I can't get over this Elvis Fields guy who the day that the thing went down is confessing to both of his sisters that he was at the scene and that he spit on one of the girl's heads. I mean, that's like, you just don't make that up. 
Like that is, well, a- it could, you know, it could also be that he feels, I don't know if he has a family. I'm just assuming that all of these lawyers, everybody on all, all the sides are getting harassing phone calls. Their parent families getting phone calls. They're, they're being like, just completely harassed. And maybe it, that could also play into it. Like I've, I've put my family through it for this long, but again, starting over also means that I have to, you know, me and my family have to endure, you know, this for much longer, but go ahead, tell, tell the people your, what you, your opinion on what one of the reasons could be. All right. Well, I mean, there's, it's twofold. I like, I like what you say is absolutely true. You know, I mean, this is a career like killing case in terms of your practice because you just can't handle anything else. Like it takes over your entire practice. It's like, we lived it with Garcia. It, it like every other case falls to the wayside. You cannot bring in new business. Like like Brad's all, all Brad's cases were shifted to his partners, and he's not bringing anything new on. And he's getting like you said, he's getting underpaid. Probably half what he typically gets paid for a case like this. However, he's got a, a case where he's got would appear to me to be some good facts. He, he's got a client that I think that he believes is actually innocent. And this is the kind of case that you can probably retire off of and start going on the like talking circuit type thing. Like it's a, it's a huge case. And this is the talking circuit pay, but I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> the talking circuit pays a lot. Like, I mean, like ask anybody that was in like any major case that they've won, especially like defense, because like the defense always gets their ass, like their ass handed to them. So in a case like this, I mean, what's his face? The guy who, uh, I can't Jody Harris, Casey Anthony. Uh, yeah, Casey Anthony, whatever her lawyer's name is. I mean, that guy built his career off that case, off that acquittal, and everyone hates her. You know what I'm saying? Like everyone thinks she's guilty, and he still built his case over that. You know, Jose Baez, that's his name. But my thing is more of I think that he probably ended up for the reasons that you stated towards the end, not so much the practice taking the hit or He's concerned about his family taking abuse. Because like I, I found out after the fact that one of Rosie's brothers is an Indiana State trooper. I mean, like that the whole thing in terms of like small town Indiana is very incestual. Not literally, but just everyone knows each other. Everyone's got family members in every part of law enforcement, the judiciary, lawyers. It's like like it's 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 just one of those things where everything is kind of in play. And so I I think ultimately, I think the bigger thing would have been him saying, look, I am not willing to take the chance uh, for you appointing somebody else and me and this other person, whoever it may be, completely disagreeing on our theory of defense. I am locked into this theory of defense. Like all that's going to happen is if you bring somebody in and he's not willing or she's not willing to, to go with my theory of defense, I'm going to have to go to Richard Allen and say, pick one of us because we both have very different opinions on how to defend your case. And Allen's going to have to pick one of us and we're going to be in the same position. So to me, that would have been the conversation that was taking place with definitely a real possibility. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a thing, you know I mean? Yeah. Like, because, and I need people to understand, no, like whoever's coming in on this case is not beholden to their pleadings or their theory of defense. They could shuttle it. Just get rid of it. I don't think that they will. I don't think that they'll lean into the, you know, the, the Odinism stuff quite as much, but the fact of the matter is there's a bunch of Odinists in Indiana. That can't, it's not, it's in, it cannot be denied. Anybody who's denying that is just like being in denial <laughs> because there clearly are people that are, uh, you know, Odin us. So, uh, all right, you guys follow me at Twitter. I know Jay and, and all the mods and all the mods. I love you guys. Thank you, Carly. Love thank you, you Andy. Uh, thank you, Missy Mayhem. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. If I missed a mod, I'm so, oh, yes, of course, Steve and Dan. Thank you for modding for me. 
uh and i can't remember if i put janet on there or not but if i missed a mod just please know that i love you and thank you guys for putting all that work in. i really really appreciate it and remember follow us uh twitter is at defense underscore diaries uh facebook is defense diaries podcast make sure you join the insiders group we've got a ton of amazing people in there that's a great great side community to this and most importantly listen to the podcast the podcast is the truth if you like what you hear here trust me you're gonna love the podcast you got ali and i go to the podcast ali and i are are crushing it on the docket we're covering everything obviously delphi avery which we're overdue and we're gonna be recording avery tomorrow allison (laughs) don't try to escape it uh got a new garcia in the can tonight uh and so but just recorded that. the Casey thing is amazing. Like if if you guys love deep dives of true crime, the docket is you got a couple of lawyers who are pretty genuine human beings and we're breaking it down for you. And then also the serial Defense diaries. Go listen, subscribe, and rate. Yes. Five stars preferably. Yes, and here, subscribe, share, like. We love you. Just thanks that. everybody. Time See to eat. Next time.